I have to say, I was, uh, sorry, I'm not supposed to be on that one. Good. Ezekiel. Okay. Um, I am, just so you know, I'm kind of tired of hearing myself talk. <laughs> I've been teaching a lot. So, I'm sure you're obviously here, so you must not be tired of hearing me talk. So I'm going to talk. But I think part of it, I just do, I'm, I'm, in, I'm like just now in this phase right now where I'm, I'm kind of, tired of the warnings of warning people and trying to wake people up and uh i was thinking man i just i don't i'm so tired of having to be depressing and uh then i just the thought came to me and i'm sure it was christ himself who put on me and just thinking like well i wonder how jesus feels he's the one having to give all these messages yeah. repeatedly so much more and so i'm not better than him so i'm if he's warning i gotta keep warning so we're gonna talk about it but we are gonna talk about um, some positive things too and give you some helpful tips at the end on how to talk to other people, how to help wake other people up. Because I know that's a, on a lot of our hearts is we wanna wake our friends and family up, people we care about, we wanna get them to listen. Um, Dad, would you mind uh, hitting the AC down like yeah. a degree? Yeah, a degree or two. Um, no, cooler. cooler. Yes. Freeze me out. Like an engineer. Okay. Um, so, but one thing I want to start with, a lot of times we hear these warnings, we're talking about prophecy, and one thing you'll feel is that it's unchangeable. And all of these, these events we're talking about are unchangeable. Okay. We're, we're not going to change these macro events. But that doesn't mean we're helpless and without power. Jesus is, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, uh, he wants to do things through us, and he is changing things and doing it. We just heard a really cool testimony about something Jeff was showing in prayer, you know, about something that we were doing at Redeeming Hope. Uh, that's pretty cool. I can tell you a few other stories. I mean, we have some other dreams in here people want to share. I, I know uh, um, my um, one of the pastors uh, at 12 Stone, I uh, was having... Uh, lunch with him and he was telling we were talking about, I said yeah I, uh, spiritual warfare seems to have increased in the last two weeks and he said oh yeah it's definitely ticked up all of us are feeling it all the guys I'm working with we felt it if you're feeling it you're not alone it's everybody has felt it but the supernatural activity has also increased he's like yeah I'm seeing more healings so people are having dreams I didn't have to bring up dreams and he's talking about it and I said what do you mean he said yeah I was he said I just led a, a group of guys through a three-day fast and uh, one of them uh, was uh, talking about, he said that at the end of the fast, he, well, he was woken up by God at like three in the morning and just heard God say, windows, go pray over your windows. And so he just got up and started praying over the windows of his house. And uh, the next morning, his four-year-old daughter uh, came down and said that she'd had a nightmare the night before that a monster was trying to get in her window. You know, so spiritual warfare is real, and but we have it in prayer is a weapon. You know, prayer helps, you know, and that's what Jeff was thought. He, he received that while you were praying, right? Prayer is powerful. Um, even uh, little things, uh, you know, my youngest, my youngest daughter was very stressed out because she's got a school project and she ordered her these stickers late that she needed for this project because she was you know, in Costa Rica with her mother. Um, and so yesterday she was so stressed at dinner, you know, this was all in her mind. I'm not gonna have the stickers. The teacher said something about, I hope you didn't order them late because Amazon isn't delivering well and things like this. And she was so stressed. So we said, let's just pray that they'll get here. So we prayed and sure enough, they came this afternoon, you know, and according to Amazon, it wasn't coming today. So um, here's this little thing. God cares about those details. You know, he's such a good God. These judgments we're talking about, you know he's just fed up. He cares about children, and it's our fault. It's not that God is mean and unchanged, and, and, and he's not the stubborn, you know. He's pretty gracious. We're the stubborn, rebellious people that won't yeah. repent, okay? So, um, you know, and like my, I know my oldest daughter, when she was like, uh, she was probably like eight, eight or nine, and she misplaced this stuffed animal that she loved. And she was like, just, 
you know, upset about it, and uh, and uh, I forget the whole. I think it was like a dream, but God just told her. He showed her to go look inside a white box, and so she thought, and oh, and she went in our bedroom and looked inside this white cabinet we have, and opened it up, and there was her stuffed animal that she had put there and forgotten where she put it, and so. You know, just one more story. I've said so many, I can tell lots of stories about just seeing God with these little details where he just cares about everything you care about. He cares about you. He cares about me, right? But we're talking about big macro things here. Um, and I will say I've had a couple others that were kind of uh, get us into that mood. Uh, one of my interns at Path to Hope had a dream this last week. Uh, he shared with us. I don't know if I shared this. I don't think I shared this last week. But he said that uh, he had been, it was, in this dream, he was, uh, well, two dreams. He said, one, he was um, in a supermarket, and he was uh, trying to pay for stuff. And then also the Wi-Fi went out, and all the payment systems went out. And, uh, and nobody could buy anything. And people were really stressed out. I, said, I asked, I said, well, did the electricity go out? And he said, no, no, the electricity didn't go out. And I said, okay, well, that wasn't a phase three dream. That was a phase one dream. Lots of other people have, have seen that. You know, that's, that's something that's going to happen. The payment systems are going to go down, and you're not going to be able to buy anything for a time. So that's why my advice to people is you need to have about two to three weeks worth of cash on hand to buy gas and food during those. So you can be, you know, have, some, have a little bit of spending money. You don't need cash for your mortgage or utilities and like that if, if the payment systems are down you're not gonna be paying your mortgage or utility bills you just need food and gas make sense but then he said he was standing in front of uh, his in another dream he was standing in front of his pantry and um, a voice someone was standing behind him and the voice said those who are not storing up are foolish and that was all it said and then he woke up well, actually, he asked him when this would happen, and the and the voice gave him a date that made it seem what best we can understand from the date uh, is that it meant three months worth of food was not enough. That only three months of food was foolish. So I'm urging you to take me seriously on that one. God's being very clear, and very direct. He's speak that's speaking like crazy. We're gonna see he's given us his word he's speaking through that he speaks to the bible he's giving everybody dreams and visions and speaking through those we've got eclipses and planetary lines, things happening in the sky that are speaking that are saying things he's got events happening that are prophetic he's got people saying things politicians saying things that are prophetic that they don't even realize i mean he's speaking all over the place and people say well God isn't speaking. He is. He's shouting. He's talking all the time. You're just not looking or listening. Okay? If you start looking, oh man, you're going to find his mess. He's talking. And you know what? And they say, well, he needs to write across the sky a message. All right. What language do you want him to write it in? Okay? Because here's how people really are. What if he took the stars and he just drew his finger and he rearranged the stars to form the, the words R-E-P-E-N-T and it's spelled repent, okay? What would you say? You would say, well, that's obvious only for English speakers. <laughs> it doesn't apply to us Chinese, you know, or Hebrews, or he would have written in that language. Okay, well then let's say he wrote it in Hebrew. Oh, well, if he wanted me to read it, he would have written it in English. You know, or if he did this a while ago, well, that's just an old message. That's an old, outdated message. That's that's for before we had the gospel. He doesn't mean that now. It doesn't matter what he does. It doesn't matter what he writes. We will rationalize and ignore it because people are rebellious. So he communicates through, in creation, he, create, he communicates without words. He communicates through symbols and signs and things that are not deniable. And we're going to look at one of those signs tonight in death, uh, which is uh, the great eclipse. Hey, Jason, come on in. So, um, but overall, what I wanted to say is have faith that you can 
change things. You can't change the macro things, but you can impact people's lives through your prayers. You can rescue people by speaking to them. And, and, and Path to Hope is evidence of that, right? Yeah. All you got to do is decide you want to make a difference. I, nobody authorized me to go do it. I didn't go out. I, you just, I felt the burden to start a ministry. We did. We've been doing whatever we felt like was in front of us that we could do to change things or help. And all of a sudden, things happen. Um, I get to teach in the Middle East. We've got a jail now. A whole cell block in a jail is becoming pacified by going through our Path to Strength course. And more and more inmates and guards are asking us for copies of the books. We've got a uh, our ministry to exploit women is taking off, right? We got momentum, we got new volunteers, we got women who are asking to come out of the life and have coffee with us and get help. We got new street teams going. People are actually getting rescued and getting baptized. Well, we just decided let's do something. Okay, you can do that too, right? Any of us can. We just have to decide we're gonna stand up and not sit on our duff, you know, because time is short. Right? That's right, but have faith in your ability to do that. Now, yes, Michael. Question, um, what would you say to someone um, if you're trying to enlighten them somewhat about what's going on? Well, yeah, you know, there's been signs and all this going on since the beginning of time. That's really good you say that. So I have a list here of those kind of responses, and we're going to go over them at the end, not now. You're jumping ahead of me. At the end, we're going to go over those and kind of say, uh, right. what does this mean? What are they actually saying? And how do you respond to it? Okay. Right. We'll, we'll talk about it together. We'll kind of brainstorm together. But we're going to do something a little different tonight where I'm not going to act, we're not going to actually go into Revelation tonight. Sorry, bait and switch. Yes. So we're going into Ezekiel. Okay. Um, in a very pertinent prophecy, nonetheless. Okay. I don't think you will feel like you did not receive interesting information tonight. Uh, well, let me, we'll get to Ezekiel 7 is going to be the main passage we're going to. And then next week we'll probably, we may do, I mean, we'll probably bring in some revelation. Uh, so never fear, hard not to. Um, but I want to remind as we're getting into Ezekiel, I need to, I want you to see that Ezekiel 7 was written 2,500 years ago about you and your family and not about your grandparents or their grandparents or any other generation. It's about you, this generation in America, not other countries, okay? So I want to explain why that's true. First, we need to understand something. Um, when you uh, think about the modern nation of Israel, do, 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 do you feel like there's any kind of conflict there with calling them Israel? Do we think there's yeah. a conflict? Is there a conflict? Is that really the, the, the true and correct name of what that country should be called? If we're talking about the geography, yeah, it should be called Israel. Okay. But if we're talking about the people, it should be called what? Judah. 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 Right? Judah is part of Israel. Mm -hmm. Judah and Benjamin together are two tribes. This is what I want to focus on here to kind of set us up and get us thinking. Okay. But I cannot underestimate the, under the importance of understanding the difference between Judah, the southern kingdom, and the northern kingdom of Israel. The northern kingdom, which were the 10 tribes whose capital was Samaria, they were a separate country for about 200 years uh, from the southern kingdom of Judah, right? Everybody knows? So if you have not read the Old Testament histories, if you're not familiar with 1st and 2nd Samuel or 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, this is news to you. You know, you're not familiar with this. But if you read through those a few times, you know this. This isn't like something hidden or mysterious. Okay. There was a civil war. They split. It used to be all 12 tribes were called Israel. From Moses 
all the way down through Joshua, through Judges, through King Saul, through King David and King Solomon. It was Israel, one nation, under that name, all 12 tribes. But Solomon's son, Rehoboam, was mean, and the 10 tribes got mad and packed up and seceded. Okay, and two tribes stayed with Rehoboam, David's grandson. Those two tribes took the name Judah, the 10 tribes took the name, kept the name Israel. Everybody follow me? Mm -hmm. This is important to understand this distinction. They fought each other like the North and South in the United States for hundreds of years off and on. They hated each other. The North became corrupt spiritually very quickly, right? They uh, implemented the golden calves in two cities and said, don't go to the temple in Jerusalem anymore. God got fed up with the Northern tribes pretty quick and removed them from the land in 722 BC the nation of Assyria the empire of Assyria came and removed them and where did Assyria put them what mountains does anybody remember Caucasus. the Caucasus Mountains where are the Caucasus Mountains between the Black and the Caspian Seas right up there between Iran and Turkey roughly for that northern part of Iran and Turkey it's right up there where Georgia Azerbaijan is and we spent a little time you know, talking about the Scythians, which I said, I think the, the correct pronunciation back then would have been Sukkotians, which is Hebrew for those in exile. Okay. Uh, the ancient Chinese said they had 10, the, the Scythians had 10 tribes. One of the tribes' name was Gad, the other name was Dan. We still have Azerbaijan, is the tribe of Asher. You, the people still call themselves Asheris. The people of Georgia call themselves Sakartivil, which is, that's their country, with Sakar is Issachar, and his oldest son was Tevelu, right, Tola in English. So we see evidence of them up there, and we know that the Scythians populated everybody from northern Indian over to Scotland, okay? And so most of the people in this room are Scythian. That means that most of the people in this room have some DNA that has come from the northern tribes of Israel, if that theory is correct, okay? And America is uh, the probably the best representation in the world of the northern kingdom concentrated again into one nation, which is probably why it's, why it's been so Christian for so long. We even have 13 stripes representing 13 tribes. You know, all of these things were prophetic. But we also have Judah here with us. The United States has been Israel, the Northern Kingdom, and Southern Kingdom reunited, okay? Because we're all one family, it's one brother. There's not supposed to be division between the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. We're supposed to be united again under Messiah as one, okay? So this isn't an anti-Semitic teaching. This is just trying to identify where the lost tribes of Israel are. Y'all follow me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the best theory. Like, lots of people, are seeing that, believe more and more people are kind of waking up and saying that there is a lot of validity to this understanding. It's just the people have forgotten where they came from, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and there's so much evidence for it. There isn't really a good competing theory, okay? But let's look at Ezekiel because it, Ezekiel is being given some instructions by God, okay? Now, when, who can tell me, when did Ezekiel preach? What, uh, roughly what years? Where was Ezekiel? Anybody, 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 anybody? <laughs> yes, he was during the Babylonian captivity, right? So, I'd like to orient you with dates a little bit to put in context. Because it's one thing to just be told dates, try to memorize dates. It's another thing to kind of feel it and visualize it so you really grab it, right? So David ruled at 1000 BC. His son Solomon took over in 970 BC. And then his son Solomon died around 920 BC. So those are dates to remember. 1000 BC, it's an easy one to remember. 970, 920, so 920. And then Israel, the northern kingdom, was exiled in 720. And Judah stayed around 
Judah didn't get exiled. They, they remained more moral and, and faithful to God longer. They lasted another 140 years until 586 B.C. when Babylon took them away. And so that's when Judah was taken away. And then after the exile, Judah came back. Only Judah came back. Uh, they came back after 70 years. So 586 was when they were exiled. So roughly 516 is when they re rebuilt the temple and came back. And if you read the book of Zechariah, which I've been doing live on my channel, if anybody's been seeing it, um, Zechariah, you see, is only referencing Judah. Just Judah. Talking about Judah. Okay. Every now and then there's a reference to Israel, but it'll be a larger sense. Okay. But usually it's Judah. Judah became Judea. You know, it stayed Judea. And the Roman Empire was Judea. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. Okay? So, it's Judah. Anyways. Think about the differences in those dates, though. So, if... And I haven't done this in my head before. So, let's imagine that... Um, let's say King David was at the time of roughly Henry VIII. Okay, that means that early 1500s. Okay, that means his son Solomon would have died around 1600, you know, right before or right about the time the pilgrims are coming to America. Okay, so that's a decent amount of time. It's not short. Then how long from that till the exile of Israel? How long was the civil war going on where the two were existing? Well, that was another 200 years. So that means that it was from the time of the pilgrims up through the War of 1812 or the Trail of Tears with the Cherokees. That's a long time, yeah. right? And then how long until Judah exiled? So let's say that that would mean the northern tribes would have been exiled around the time of the Trail of Tears with the Cherokees. And then the southern kingdom would have remained for another 140 years. It would have taken up to John F. Kennedy. Okay. So now you got a context for the amount of time we're talking about, right? It's not, they're not short times, okay? So why am I focusing so much on that? To really kind of separate these names in your head and help you understand that before, during Saul and David and Solomon, everybody would have used the name Israel, okay? If you have a prophet in the Old Testament that says Israel is Israel that, in their mind, it's all 12. But after the Civil War, they wouldn't have done that. Okay, if you're reading Isaiah, you're reading Jeremiah, you're reading Ezekiel, you're reading any of these prophets, if they say Israel, they mean the Northern Kingdom. If they say Judah, they mean the Southern Kingdom. Y'all follow me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because they, to them, they were two political entities. They're not gonna mix names, okay? It would be like calling the Confederacy the Union, you know? It would like totally confuse things for whoever they're speaking to. All right. So now, understanding that, Ezekiel was Jewish. He was from Judah. And he had not returned. He was in Babylon. Okay. He was in Babylon when he received the call from God to prophesy. But in verse 3, what does it say in, in Ezekiel 2? In Ezekiel 2, it says, And he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. That for they are an impudent and stubborn children. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. Okay, now, so when you read this without that context, you just think, oh, Ezekiel's an Israelite. He's over there. God's telling him, you're going to talk to your own people. No, the Israel, the exiles of Israel were not living there in Babylon with Judah. They were up far away in a different set of mountains, in the Caucasus Mountains. So that's why God is saying, I am sending you to the children of Israel. Ezekiel's about to become a missionary. You get it? Okay. He's going to the 10 tribes that pulled out. Yes, he's going to the northern kingdom, the exiles from the northern kingdom. Interesting fact. <laughs> the Scythians, according to Wikipedia, 
appeared in the Caucasus Mountains around 720 BC, and nobody knows where they came from. Mm -hmm. And we really don't know much at all about their history, except that about 100 years after they first appeared, they had a queen named Tamar. And under her queenship, the Scythians just randomly came down out of the countries where George and Azerbaijan is, and they came down and they tried to conquer the land of Israel. And they conquered a city, bet and then they couldn't hold it and they had to go back. I don't you know. So if they're not the Northern Kingdom, why would they do that? And why is the queen's name Tamar? You know, that's a very Hebrew name. Anyways, so Ezekiel 3. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, uh, verse 1, eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. Verse 4, son of man, go to the house of Israel. Okay. Now, we're going to look at verse 4. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the story of uh, um, Ezekiel. It's kind of a hard story, but it says he's telling Ezekiel to perform an act for the house of Israel to be like a, a, a visual prophecy. It says, you also son of man, take a clay tablet, lay it before you, portray it on a city, Jerusalem. Lay siege against it, build a siege wall against it, heap up a mound against it, set camps against it also, and place battering rams against it all around. So when Ezekiel's doing this, Jerusalem had not been fully destroyed. There was three successive invasions of, of Jerusalem, of Judah, and Ezekiel was removed as an exile in one of the first two phases. But So he's doing this before the final destruction by Nebuchadnezzar in 586. So he's actually prophesying to the northern tribes in exile that Jerusalem is about to be conquered. Okay. Moreover, take for yourself an iron plate, set it as an iron wall between you and the city, set your face against it, and it shall be besieged, and you shall lay siege against it. This will be a sign uh, to the house of Israel. Lie also on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days, that 90 days shall you bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. So God has just told to him, you're gonna lie on your left side, in the street, you're gonna go lie on your left side in front of everybody with something on you that says iniquity of Israel, and you're gonna do that for more than a year, every day for a year, for 390 days. Fun being a prophet. Um, and when you have completed them, lie again on your right side, then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have laid on you a day for each year. So 40 days after that for Judah. But the whole point here is, do you see how God himself, speaking to Ezekiel, has distinguished between Israel and Judah? Is it very clear? They are not the same. Okay. If you don't read carefully, you just think Israel, Judah, Israel, Judah, doesn't matter. No, it does. They're different. Okay. Now, um, and I want to point out, we're going to read Ezekiel 7, but I want to point it in Ezekiel 8, because so far we have just talked about the house of Israel, go to Israel. But in, in chapter 8, it says, And it came to pass in the sixth year and the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah uh, sitting before me. So elders of Judah. So now he's specified, I'm not talking to the elders of Israel. This was a day when the elders of Judah came to me. Okay, my own people. Okay. Now we'll go to Ezekiel 7. So all of that, I'm just trying to really drill in. Uh, fix this and I'll take it. It's a little flat for the camera. Um, just trying to drill home that Israel and Judah were different. Okay. So, and the modern nation of Israel today is Judah. The, the genetically... The inhabitants there are, are just the southern kingdom peoples, okay? They're not the northern kingdom peoples. So, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, and you, son of man, thus says the Lord God to the land of Israel, an end. The end has come upon the four corners of the land. Now the end has come upon you. So we're about to see... Um, a prophecy of destruction against the land of Israel. Okay? 
But I want to remind, what year is Ezekiel prophesying in? <clears throat> Roughly. If Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C., it's right before that, right? Just think, 600 B.C., 600 B.C., okay? So he's prophesying around 600 B.C., 590 B.C. What year was the northern kingdom exiled in? No, that was Judah. What year? 722 B.C., 722 B.C. So the northern kingdom was already destroyed and exiled 120 years before this prophecy. So Israel's already been destroyed. So why is he prophesying a destruction on the land of Israel again? You know, we read this and without thinking, without context, without the dates, we think, oh, it's about what happened. It's about what happened with Assyria. This has already been fulfilled. No, it hasn't. Yes. What, I, what I'm seeing is you have the ten tribes of which is Israel spread out throughout the world. Yes. And you've got the two tribes of Judah. Mm -hmm. So really, isn't this prophecy coming now to the rest of the world that, that is the that's, ten tribes? That's my point. Is This is a prophecy about destruction or judgment coming to the land of Israel after Israel was already destroyed. Mm -hmm. That means this has to be for a secondary destruction in the future from Ezekiel. But between him and now, has that ever happened? What we're about to see here, has it ever happened? And so you think, well, maybe this is talking about right before Jesus comes back, like around Armageddon. But that is Judah over there in Israel. That's Judah. That's not Israel. And in Revelation, you don't see that. You see Jesus coming to protect Judah from destruction, not destroying them. Everybody follow me? So this has to be for a future from Ezekiel, a land where the descendants of the northern tribes of Israel have regathered that are not to be confused with Judah, a future destruction of that land. And as we look through history, I don't know of any country that fits that bill other than America. I don't know of any destruction that has ever happened to any of the descendants of the Scythian tribes. Because even if you said, well, it happened to that Scythian country, you know, well, but then what about the rest of the Scythians? You know, really, the United States, where it came from, was fleeing religious persecution. Okay. Right? So it's like from Europe and all these countries where whenever there was religious persecution, those families came here. It's like the most faithful followers of God all congregated here and formed a nation. So that's why the America, in my opinion, is the best representation of the Northern Kingdom today. Okay, it's up to you whether you want to agree with me or not. Um, but I think we're going to see some things in here that confirm it further. Um, so let's go ahead and read, because uh, I believe this prophecy, and I'm not the only one that believes this prophecy, is about the United States. Uh, God also calls us uh, Mystery Babylon. So if you read in Revelation 17 and 19, um, and we're not, he's not calling us Babylon as in Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. The Hebrew, he's actually calling us Babel, like the Tower of Babel. Okay, which is a very apt name for New York City, for example. Okay, we're going to talk more about that when we get to Revelation 17 and 18. You can read Isaiah 13 is another chapter that is probably about us. And uh, Isaiah 18 is definitely about us. And uh, I wrote about that in depth in my book, Revelation Unfolding. But we're going to focus on Ezekiel 3. It says an end. The end has come upon the four corners of the land. Now, just an, I'm going to give you a preview. We're going to talk about this eclipse that is coming to the United States uh, this year on April 8th. There's already been two eclipses, and this is a map. And when you look at the map of these eclipses, you can kind of see the four corners being touched. Mm -hmm. We have the northeast corner, 
This is, yeah, you can say this is the southeast. This is definitely the southwest if you, I mean, lowest southwest down here with Texas. And then we got the northwest over here. I mean, it's not perfect, four corners, but um, God was actually designing a symbol with this, which is the Aleph of the Hebrew language, but we'll get to that in a minute. So back to Ezekiel 7. The end, the end has come upon the four corners of the land. Now the end has come upon you. And I will send my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways. And I will repay you for all your abominations. And I, as I'm reading this, I'm feeling the weight of God's voice. Mm -hmm. I believe this prophecy is for us. Not just because we're followers of Christ, but because we're Americans in this generation. I think this is spoken... 2,500 years ago for us. Okay. My eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity. But I will repay your ways, and your abominations will be in your midst. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. And I believe that statement is not only a reference to the atheists who would deny him in rebellion, uh, who also will know that he is Lord but to the millions of lukewarm Christians who want to just say the Lord's Prayer like a magic spell and then prance around and do whatever they want after that. Okay. They will know that He is the Lord, which means He says what we do. He is King. Thus says the Lord God, a disaster, a singular disaster. Behold, it has come. An end is come. The end is come. It has dawned for you. Behold, it has come. Doom has come to you, you who dwell in the land. The time has come. A day of trouble is near, and not of rejoicing in the mountains. Now upon you I will soon pour out my fury and spend my anger upon you. I will judge you according to your ways, and I will repay you for all your abominations. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will repay you according to your ways, and your abominations uh, will be in your midst. Then you shall know that I am the Lord who strikes. Behold the day, behold it has come. Doom has gone out. The rod has blossomed. Pride has budded. You guys catch that line? Pride has budded. Violence has risen up into a rod of wickedness. We have such violence going on in our cities and everywhere, and it's going to increase. None of them shall remain. Who's, gonna, who's not going to remain? None of those engaged in pride or violence. None of their multitude, none of them, nor shall there be wailing for them. The time has come, the day draws near. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn, for wrath is on their whole multitude. It's going to hit the whole country. Okay? We're not going to sit here self-righteously pointing at other people. Okay? We're going, to have to, we're going to have to go through it with our country. For the seller uh, shall not return to what has been sold, though he may still be alive. For the vision concerns the whole multitude and it shall not turn back. No one will strengthen himself who lives in iniquity. Okay, now that's a key. No one will strengthen himself who lives in iniquity. All you have to do is repent. We don't have to live in iniquity. Nobody has to live in iniquity. Okay, we can repent. And I'm trusting most of us here, I think, have. You know, I'm preaching to the choir. You know, I mean, we're, all still, we're all still working on things, of course, but um, we need to um, be trumpeting the message of repentance. They have blown the trumpet and made everyone ready, but no one goes to battle. It almost sounds like a draft that nobody answers. Yeah, I was going to ask, who's blowing the trumpet? Here? Okay, well, they're calling everybody to go to battle, but nobody's going to battle. So that's an interesting idea. U.S. government does a military draft and yeah. nobody shows? Mm -hmm. I hadn't considered that possibility. Mm -hmm. I could see Gen Z doing that. 
I don't know. There's a lot of great ones at Bunton Tony's, though. A lot of great ones. So, I can, I don't know, it's just interesting. I hadn't thought of that possibility. For my wrath is on all their multitude. The sword is outside and the pestilence and famine within. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Wars outside our borders, mm -hmm. pestilence and famine within, especially when these next events happen. Mm -hmm. Whoever is in the field will die by the sword, and whoever is in the city, famine and pestilence will devour him. Mm -hmm. I think I prefer the field. Yeah. Those who survive will escape and be on the mountains, like doves of the valleys, all of them mourning, each for his iniquity, Every hand will be feeble, feeble, and every knee will be as weak as water. They will also be girded with sackcloth, which means mourning. Horror will cover them. Shame will be on every face. Baldness on all their heads. This is an interesting key right here. They will throw their silver into the streets, and their gold will be like refuse. Okay. So that's kind of a confirmation idea. I've always wondered about gold and silver. I've heard, I've seen people with dreams where the gold prices and silver prices are doing certain things. But then I've, there, David Wilkerson, uh, who was a pastor in the 1970s, had a long vision where he saw that the price of silver and gold was gonna go to zero, like it was gonna become worthless. So how would that happen? Well, um, and have no fear. When the CBDCs are released, they're going to make it illegal to own gold or silver or do any trading in it and they'll confiscate it. They already did that during the Great Depression. If you don't know that, long before we had technology. Your money was backed by gold. Yes, the money was backed by gold, but they made it illegal to own it and they confiscated it. Like anybody, you know, they came and took it. So you had to turn it in. Uh, easier to get away with hiding it back then than probably today. Uh, their silver and their gold, but if nobody's going to receive it, right? Gold and silver is only worth something if you can buy something with it. You can't eat it. So you might be brave enough and bold enough to hide it, but who's going to sell you anything? Because they can't do anything with it. It's going to get confiscated from them. You know, that's what makes it worthless. Make sense? Mm -hmm. You can wish and hope it'll have some value, but someone has to be willing to receive it from you. And if there's only a handful of people who would receive it from you, it becomes worthless. Make sense? You gotta have high demand to have high value. They will throw, let's see, their silver and their gold will not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They will not satisfy their souls nor fill their stomachs because it became their stumbling block of iniquity. As for the beauty of his ornaments, he set it in majesty but they made from it the images of their abominations, their detestable things. This is a reference to the rainbow. Okay. As for the beauty of his ornaments, he set them in majesty, but they made from it the images of their abominations, their detestable things. Therefore, I have made it like refuge to them. I will give it as plunder into the hands of strangers and to the wicked of the earth as spoil, and they shall defile it. I will turn my face from them, and they will defile my secret place. For robbers shall enter it and defile it. Make a chain, for the land is filled with crimes of blood, and the city is full of violence. Therefore, I will bring the worst of the Gentiles, and they will possess their houses. So... That's, I think, what we were talking about earlier with the fifth column. That's kind of the beginning of that, okay? I will cause the pomp of the strong to cease, and all their holy places shall be defiled. Destruction comes. So churches burn down, and that is what we've seen uh, in dreams. Like many dreams are the churches being burned down and as part of persecution. They will seek peace, but there shall be none. Disaster will come upon disaster, and rumor will be upon rumor. Then they will seek a vision from a prophet, but the law will perish from the priest and counsel from the elders. So that, when I read that, it reminded me of what Marilyn, who's not, Marilyn's not here tonight, but she asked last week, says, why aren't the pastors talking about this? Okay, 
Well, there's lots of prophets talking about it. Lots of watchmen out there. I'm not the only guy that talks about these things. There's a solid community. You go on YouTube, you find all kinds of watchmen. They're all noticing different things. And I found it's like, it was really interesting because my focus has been revelation and dreams and visions. Like that's what I've focused on and really studied that in prophetic words. And I like what I focused on because they're very clear. <laughs> like I get the most information. But there's other watchmen I found recently that are like studying the Bible codes and they're like doing, you know, software search with the Bible codes and they found all these code words encoded in, in the Torah and elsewhere with future events. And then we got people studying these eclipses and the signs in the sky and the things they're finding in the town names, which we're gonna talk a little bit today. And, and so it's like everybody's like, and then there's others that are looking at the Hebrew calendar and the timing of days and pulling understandings out of that. And what's interesting is we're all getting the same messages. It's the same message. He's saying the same things, okay? He's warning everybody with the same words, same language, you know. So he's speaking. But the people will seek a vision from a prophet, but the law will perish from the pastor and counsel from the elders. And the pastors aren't teaching the law of God, are they? It's all self-help messages, mm -hmm. right? And that's really part of the problem. Um, and if you really wanna jump forward in your spiritual walk, if there's a shift you can do in your, in your mindset. Um, stop thinking about the gospel and the Bible as being self-help mechanisms, okay? Instead, look at them as God's word revealing himself to you so you can have a relationship with him by knowing who he really is, right? And you can start asking yourself questions like, what does God feel? What does Jesus feel? What is, and, and when you start asking yourself, what is Jesus feeling today? What is he feeling from this? Man, your heart, it just changes because all of a sudden you're empathetic. You're like, man, he is probably hurting. You know, I'm sorry. And it changes your prayer. And it changes what you want to spend your time doing. Make sense? Yeah. So, but if you really pay attention in most of the churches, uh, there's some talk of righteousness, but there's also a lot, it always circles back to self-help. You know, you need to do this so you can be a good dad and a mom and a wife and a child and a boss. And, you know, you gotta do this so you can manage your finances. And, you know, it's like, how about... We study God's character, learn who he is, align ourselves with him, repent, and let him transform us, right? You know, and, and part of the issue, you know, think about how much, how much of scripture, those of you who know it well, how much of scripture is dedicated to parenting advice? What percent? Big percent? No. Not much, right? Yeah, really tiny. Couple of short passages, honor thy father and thy mother. Okay, how much of the Bible is dedicated to marriage advice? Tiny couple <laughs> chapters, right? How many sermons do we spend on marriage and parenting? Okay, how much of the Bible is dedicated to prophecy? 26%. Twenty-six percent in both the New Old and New Testament. So, if we love God, we should love, and pastors should love, what God cares about. If you love somebody, you care about what they care about. If our God is saying, "I can say anything I want to these people," I'm going to make twenty-six percent of it be about future events and prophecy. That tells me. He made, he, that was important to him. That was about a fourth of what he wanted to talk about. So if I'm not, if I'm ignoring it completely from the pulpit, something's wrong. Make sense? There's a, there's a misalignment of what God cares about from what we care about. And in this day and age, considering that these passages are 
a lot of them are for our generation, I tend to think that these are a major folks should be a major part of what we're talking about and not just 26% right now. You know, if we were hundred years ago, okay, 26%, that would make sense. Okay, but now I think it's a little different. The king will mourn, the prince will be clothed with desolation and the hands of the common people will tremble. I will do to them according to their way and according to what they deserve, I will judge them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And that's his entire purpose is repentance and people, you know, straightening up and recognizing what's true. He won't be defeated and he won't be ignored. He is just gracious and patient. Um, and that, that line, I will do to them according to their way. I've always kind of understood, you know, we have a certain number of lives that we owe God for the babies that have been aborted. Okay. But who would he take? Well, I just thought about, it. well, wouldn't the most logical lives for him to take would be the other children of women and, and parents that have had abortions? Okay. Or the women themselves? Definitely the doctors and the nurses and whoever else works in these clinics, okay? Wouldn't it be more likely to take the lives of the men who forced the women to get one that didn't want one, right? Now, does that mean that everybody involved in an abortion, that would happen? No, no, it doesn't at all because there's repentance, okay? Repentance saves us from the penalty, okay? It takes you out from under God's wrath, right? But, you think, well, oh, that's really scary. You don't say something like that's so mean. Well, wait a second. Why should an innocent person have to die for somebody else's abortion? You guys hear what I'm saying? It's actually just, okay? But there's plenty of, plenty of crimes many of us have to pay for. So really, anybody who's not repentant and walking well with God is, is vulnerable. And that's why we gotta call people to repent. So, before we move into the eclipse, do we have any questions? Do you guys have any questions about Ezekiel 7? I know it's kind of heavy. Any idea or thought who the, the king will mourn, the prince will be clothed with desolation? Is, um, is, that, is that talking about political... So if, this, if, if we're right, and this is for us, then I think that this would have to be referring to uh, Donald Trump and uh, uh, Junior, Donald Trump Junior, and, and or possibly his other son, uh, because the succession of leaders that are go we're going to have, we're, we're, we've already got Joe Biden. By the way, do you know that the name Joe Biden is prophetic? Think about it. Joseph, right? Mm -hmm. Who were Joseph's two sons? Manasseh. Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim became the Anglo-Saxon people. Manasseh was the Celtic people. Where they congregated? In America. So this is Joseph here. Judah is the Jews in Israel now, and there's Jews here too, but we are Joseph, okay? And Biden in Hebrew, literally you say, Biden, but then, in judgment. <laughs> America, in judgment. That's what Joseph Biden means. In Hebrew. So, um, the next leader is Kamala Harris. And uh, she's going to do a pretty nasty job. I believe it's her. There could be a scenario where it could be Hillary, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's Kamala. Okay. Um, huh? Michelle Obama. No, not going to be Michelle Obama. Surprise. Nope. Pretty positive about that. Um, and then after her, it will be Donald Trump. Okay. Donald Trump will achieve the full destruction of the United States under his watch. Uh, God has appointed Trump to be the one who destroys the United States. And um, then after him, it will be a new country that will be Babylon fully at that point. 
uh, ruled by a foreign power, and Obama will be the uh, American Antichrist. Okay. He's one of the ten horns. He's not the Antichrist. So those are the leaders we're going to have. So when I think about that, I think, okay, I got Biden, I got Kamala, I got Trump, and I got Obama. Well, Biden's not going to make it very long, and I don't think he's even aware of what's going on. So I don't think he could mourn, and I can't see Hunter Biden mourning either, okay? Kamala would be a queen, so she doesn't fit, and Obama's not going to mourn. He's the one going to cause desolation. He's not a nice guy. So I have to believe this is Trump and one of his sons being, in my opinion. And I think he would. I think he would mourn when he sees the destruction. Yes. Now, with what you said, do you think Trump will cause the destruction yes. or will happen under his? No, I think, I think Trump will actually cause it, okay, uh, through his arrogance and pride. So, um, I know this is confusing to a lot of Christians because a lot of Christians were very happy with what he did in his first administration. But I'll point out that basically the things that Christians like, there's three things Christians like that Donald Trump did. They, uh, they like that he appointed pro-life judges, right? We like it that he moved the embassy to Jerusalem. And we like it that he started building the wall in, on the border. Okay. Now, the, the wall on the border is more of a conservative value. It's not necessarily a Christian value. Okay. There isn't a concept of protecting your borders against enemies and what we have really going on is an invasion, not immigration, etc. But that's a different discussion which we've already kind of talked about. But the other two are definitely godly things. Pro-life judges, Christians are supposed to be pro-life and we're supposed to be pro-Jerusalem, be in one piece, not divided, okay? Um, so those are two good things. But what I've understood is uh, Donald Trump only did those things because Steve, and Steve Bannon came up with them. Those were Steve Bannon's ideas, not Donald Trump's. Donald Trump is more of a liberal moderate, okay? Steve Bannon came up with those ideas. He knew that was what would get him elected if he promised it. The one thing Trump did is he did not want to look like a typical pro uh, politician because of his pride. And uh, so he kept his promises. That was unique about him, that he did what he promised he would do. So in that respect, I did like a lot of things he did. I voted for him, right? But I've been shocked because I thought he would be implementing God's will going back in. I thought, you know, but I've read the words. I've read what God is saying. And he says that Trump is, uh, he calls him the evil lying king, okay? And, but he calls Biden the more evil king. And he calls Kamala the most evil queen, Okay. So it's not that God is a fan of Democrats. It's that God, you know, he's, he's properly ranking them <laughs> in order of evilness, um, but he doesn't like any of them, okay? And here's the, 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 the three things to understand. If you're a Christian and you're following Donald Trump, you're following a lie. He is a liar, okay? He's not being honest with you. And he lit up his house with the rainbow colors the same day that the White House did in, in response to that bill. Right now, he is saying over and over again on the campaign trail that, he, that we need to compromise on abortion in order to get elected. Christians aren't hearing it. They're like, no, 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 he's not saying that. I didn't hear that. Yeah, why? Because you're going to these huge stadiums and worshiping him as your political savior, okay? And so that is the real uh, problem, is that um, in uh, 1 Samuel, the people of Israel went to Samuel, the prophet, and said, uh, we want a king, because they were worried about Assyria. They were worried about the Assyrian Empire, gearing up an army, and they were getting fearful. They said, we don't have a king, we're just ruled by these judges. We feel like we've got a weak political structure. We need something more solid. We need a military. So they said, give us a king. Samuel grieved. He went to God and God spoke to Samuel and said, don't take it personal, Samuel. So they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. Right. So Trump is a trap. Trump is a trap that God is allowing to eliminate all 
the Christians that are the false Christians, that are not really followers of Jesus Christ, who are followers of an earthly human Messiah that believe in a political solution. If you believe that you can save the United States politically, you go vote for Trump, okay? If you uh, understand that there is no political solution for the country, then you focus on the spiritual solution, which is calling people to repentance, okay? Trump can't save the country. Judgment has been decreed. We've already crossed the line. Okay. This is what God is speaking. Now you can, you can uh, say, well, I don't know that God spoke that. And I would say, well, that's because you haven't looked. Right? You want me to show you the evidence? I'll show you the evidence. You can decide for yourself. But when I have multiple, multiple prophets of God whose prophecies are coming true, and they're all saying this, you know, you have to look at what the man's actually saying and doing. So what has been prophesied specifically is that what Trump is going to do is after he gets in office, he is going to be the one who forces Israel to divide Jerusalem with the Palestinians, okay? And that act, the moment Jerusalem is divided, and I don't know if it happens when they sign the paper or if it happens when it's actually legally transferred the power. I don't know which that is, but when that happens, that's when Jesus breaks the sixth seal and the earthquake hits the middle of the United States and millions of people die. And the Mississippi River will become an ocean. Much of California goes underwater. All of Louisiana goes underwater. And then a few months after that begins the Civil War. God says, you divide my land, I will divide yours. I divide it physically, I divide it politically. And that will be the end, of, that's, that's officially the end of the United States. Okay, Trump's country will be called, I believe it, there's people that have seen him, the name of it, I believe it's called the Republic of the United States. After that, he, Trump, that's the name Trump gives it, the, the New England, the New England states, the ones that secede first and declare war. Um, people have seen the seal on Trump's podium. I mean, all of this has been seen. So, you know, basically, um, you know, God has said very clearly, the civil war is between the blue and the red, you need to be the white. You need to separate yourself from these political battles because there is no political solution. You don't need a king, you need repentance, you need me. Okay, and everybody's worshiping Trump. And on top of that, all of Trump's spiritual advisors are part of the new apostolic reformation. Okay, um, it's a, a terrible branch, of the, it's really the false church, it's the beginning of the false church except for Franklin Graham. Franklin Graham is uh, uh, the only one I would not put in that category That's, that he considers a spiritual advisor. So now I say all of that as a lifelong conservative, who's always been pro-life, always will be pro-life, believes in liberty, believes in the Declaration of Independence, loves our country's history. All the things that you think Trump stands for I love those things. I think those are godly principles. I just don't believe that God, that Trump actually stands for them. I think he's a liar, and I think he's going to turn on Christians and actually be part of the one, one of the ones who starts persecuting and killing Christians. I think he's going to force Israel to sign this treaty and divide the land, and he's going to cause the destruction of the civil war. I just think he's a liar, full of pride. We know he's full of pride. And what does the Bible say? It says, God, what? The proud. He opposes the proud. How can Trump be God's man if he's so proud? Right? And as Christians, we all know that, right? We all know Trump isn't God's man, right? Does anybody really think Trump's a godly man? Anybody? Or do we know he's got an ego? The only thing he did was when he exited the Capitol and walked across toward the were burning the yes. Capitol. Yes, right. And held up the Bible. And I will and I will say this: I don't wish to, I don't wish to condemn or criticize his first administration. The things that were there's a lot of things he did that I did. I said I understand it. I like it. Okay. But when you have rose-colored glasses on, you you don't see other things, right? Right? Like, 
how long, I mean, he, up until recently, he was still bragging about that injectable cure everybody got and how he's the one who invented that, right? I read a quote from the other day. Where, you know, who thinks that the way we withdrew from Afghanistan was good? Raise your hand. Anybody think we withdrawing so quickly and crazily was a good idea? Well, Joe Biden did it in July and August of that year. And when he announced he was going to do it in April, Trump officially put out an official statement about how stupid that was because he would have gotten us out quicker. That he was going to take us out in May. It's like, okay. So he has an ego. So if you know he's got an ego as a Christian, biblically speaking, you know God opposes the proud. So how do we believe Trump is a repentant man that would be listening to God and full of his spirit? That isn't possible until he actually is, becomes a repentant man. Okay, so if that's not possible, then what are you voting for? You're only voting for the Republican Party and the idea that Trump's a fighter. And so you think that by putting a fighter in there in charge of the Republican Party, You've got a fighter who's going to impose the values that you think are good on the rest of the rebellious Americans who don't want them, right? And that's the problem. And that's why you're going to get the Civil War, because it's not that those values aren't good. It's that how do you force people to be good who aren't repentant? The real problem is with the American people. The American people have to repent. And if the American people haven't repented, there's no leader you can put in there. So if you do want to vote, I'm not voting at all. I, I'm voting for Jesus, and that means I'm not voting because I don't believe there's a, I don't believe there's a solution. I don't believe there are... I believe the future is the millennial kingdom of Christ, and I don't believe it's the United States of America. And that's my belief, and that's how I'm going to act. If you believe different, then I just urge you to use your vote to vote for someone who's actually pro-life and actually pro-biblical values and pro-God and not someone who's pretending to be that to get your vote. Okay. it's my humble opinion. But I would urge you to listen to some of the words and go looking and, and looking at what others are hearing. I'm not the only one that is, that is understanding this. Okay. All right, so any other questions about Ezekiel 7? Yes? Why do you think Obama is one of the ten homes? Uh, because it's been explicitly said in one of you be ready's words. Okay. I've, now, I suspected he was because there are literally uh, thousands of dreams. I would, I would speculate if, if, I could, if I knew what everybody in the country was dreaming based on my statistical analysis, I speculate that it's probably at least a couple hundred thousand Americans have had dreams about Obama returning and, and operating as a dictator with no constitution uh, and like uh, basically like an antichrist and doing antichrist things. But I knew uh, that, and some prophets, some people have, I think, made a mistake and believe he is the antichrist, the little horn of Daniel. And they'll say that. Um, for a various variety of reasons. But Obama does not meet the qualifications of the Antichrist. There's a couple of characteristics he doesn't have. One is, God identifies the United States as Mystery Babylon, and also the Western world as Mystery Babylon. Well, if you look at Revelation 17, 18, the whore of Babylon rides the beast. She's different from the beast. So the beast, the actual Antichrist, cannot come from the whore, from Babylon. They're separate. And the ten horns of the beast eat the whore. Okay, so the Babylon, the whore of Babylon, and the ten horns of the beast are different, right? So Obama cannot be, uh, like, ruling Babylon and be the beast at the same time. Okay, second, uh, he's not a Syrian. You know, the Isaiah and Micah call the Antichrist the Assyrian, so that means he has to come from... Turkey, you know, that area where the Assyrian Empire used to be. Uh, third, Obama's name. Now, there is an interesting little prophecy where somebody, uh, one pastor, real, you know, said that when Jesus has, Jesus has a place where he says, I look up and I saw lightning from heaven, you know, coming from heaven, and I forget the exact phrase, 
but in Hebrew, basically, if you had, if he'd said that in Hebrew, it would trans. The Hebrew would have been, "I looked up and Barack Obama." Okay, that's how the Hebrew would have sounded. So based on that, I said, "So I think he's the Antichrist." It's like, well, he actually could have been referring to Barack Obama as like the American Antichrist, but the actual global Antichrist, his name in Greek has to add up to six six six. Revelation 13 says, he was wisdom, let him calculate the name of the beast, for it is the number of his name, which is the number of man, 666. Uh, Obama's name in Greek does not add up to 666. And he's not a Syrian. And he's not, he is Muslim, but he's not going to be declared the Mahdi, which is the Muslim Messiah. So Obama has been actively working, though, what he and Hillary Clinton were actively working on since 2013, was trying to help Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey, whose last name does add up to 666, and who is a Syrian, they've been trying to work and help him to establish the Islamic Caliphate, a new beast. Okay, so I'm actually looking at Erdogan's son. I believe Bilal Erdogan is the one I've got my eye really on, as far as that goes. But, remembering Ezekiel 7, we don't have to worry about the Antichrist. We, we're probably not going to make it that long. <laughs> Okay, he comes later. Okay, we got a, we got problems of our own. The Americans going into Americans going into judgment first, before the world. So, did I answer that question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Any other questions about Ezekiel seven? We're getting good questions tonight. Mm -hmm. No, Jeff, you look like yeah, Brianna. Not really about Ezekiel. Like, oh, how to get the numbers? Yes. Okay, good. Let me look that up for you here. Um, one second. So in Greek and Hebrew, every letter, like Roman numerals, every letter has a value. So in Roman numerals, um, in Roman numerals, you only have certain letters. Okay. Certain letters have... Can y'all see that? Mm -hmm. So certain letters have numbers in Roman, like the, uh, an I in, 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 in Latin is a one, a B is five, right? But it's just certain ones. But in Hebrew and Greek, every letter has a number value. And they did not have separate symbols for numbers. They didn't have separate, so if they needed to do math, like if you're a businessman and you're trying to write down two plus two equals four, what you would have written is beta plus beta equals delta. You would have used those letters, okay? So a person looking at the paper or the, the clay tablet or the, you know, the, the scroll that you're writing on, they would have seen beta, beta, delta, and they would have understood that's a math equation, uh, not a word. Make sense? But like today, like, but because of that, every word and everybody's name had a number value, and they would call it the number of the word or the number of the name. And it was almost like, um, you know, your astrological sign. Like you would have known your number, the number of your name. You would know that B is a uh, uh, two, right? And then Rho, which Rho is right down there, that's a hundred, right? And then the E would probably be, would say an epsilon is five, so we're at 107. And then A is alpha, 108. And how many N's do you have, one or two? two. So that we knew, and knew, that'd be 50 plus 50, so now we're 208, and then another alpha, so 209. So the number, the number of your name is 209. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So Jesus' name in Greek, six is the number of man. Why? Because what is seven? Seven is completion. Right? Seven is the number of completion. Six is the number of man because we are... Less than seven. We are less than complete. We are incomplete without Christ. And we are made of carbon. If you read any science fiction novel, we're made of carbon. We're called carbon-based life forms, right? You heard that term? What's the atomic number of carbon? Six. Who designed carbon? God. Who determined the atomic number of carbon be six? God did it. Okay. Any planet in the universe you go to and you look at carbon... It's going to have an atomic number six because it's got, because uh, of the electrons, the protons, and neutrons, right? So seven is the atomic number of nitrogen. Nitrogen is the chemical of life, right? Eight 
then if eight and seven is completion, eight is more than seven, so it's more than complete. So if man is incomplete, who is more than complete? God. So eight is the number of God. So the Antichrist name, the number of his name in Greek will add up to 666, but Jesus' name in Greek adds up to 888. Jesus. And every early Christian knew that. So when John wrote that, it was clear, right? So basically, if you want to know if somebody can be the Antichrist, you have to take their name, look in a Greek newspaper, like you got to figure out how the Greeks writing their name in the newspaper, then add up the values, and if you get 666, they can be the Antichrist, okay? If you can't get it with their name, eh, eliminate it, okay? Yes? Um, some manuscripts read 616, so what is that about? Um, I'd have to, those are probably the, the error filled manuscripts from the 300 AD that, yeah, I don't think, no, I think they're just, it's an error. 666 is what the, the Texas Receptus says, which is, I'll have to, I haven't looked at that particular issue with the Texas Receptus, but there are three Greek manuscripts that were discovered in the 1800s that dated to 300 AD around the time of Constantine and later was determined those had been part of a rush order these monks were asked to do and they had errors in them. But for a time, people t thought they were older, old and so more accurate, but they're not. Okay, so. Any other questions? Were? Good question, all over the place. No? Anything about Russia and China attacking the United States and prophecy? Um, where is it? Do you mean? Yeah, I was wondering if it's in Revelation somewhere. Yeah, it's the, it's well, it's, it's referenced multiple times in prophecy. So if we understand that America is Israel, right? You're going to hear a lot of people, okay, talking about um, the war of Gog and Magog, right? That's it. Yeah. Gog and out. Now the word of the Lord came to me. Since Son of Man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around and put your hooks in your jaws and lead you out with all your army horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Iran, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togomar from the far north and all its troops, probably Turkey. Uh, prepare yourselves to be ready. Da -da -da. And then it says in verse 10, that says the Lord God on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder, to take booty, had to stretch out your hand against the waste places. Um, and in verse 14, therefore so a man prophesy and say to God, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? You will come upon against my pe people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. Remember, we're in Ezekiel. We just got through showing Israel is not Judah. Mm -hmm. So you could go out, you can go to the Christian bookstore, you can go online, you can order any Christian prophecy book, and almost all of them, when they talk about the war of Gog and Magog, they're gonna talk about Russia creating a coalition of nations to attack the state of Israel today. That I'm saying is, should be called Judah, okay? But that's because they're forgetting that Ezekiel would not have called, he would not have mixed up the terms Israel and Judah. The confusing part is, what should be called Judah, we're calling Israel. Okay, that's what's making it confusing. Actually, when the United Nations in 1948 established Israel and the Jews were trying to decide what they wanted to call it, they almost called it Judah. Like I think at the last minute, they just decided on Israel. Okay, would have been more helpful for understanding prophecy. But the point is, uh, who are these people up here? Well, everybody's pretty much in agreement that Gog is a, a certain leader. Magog is most certainly Mongolia and China, okay? Mm -hmm. Prince of Ross is the Prince of Russia. Meshech is 
Moscow and Tobol is Tbilis, which is another major town in, in Russia. So, um, yeah, Russia and China invade the United States with these other countries. That's the phase four, which I've talked about. And you ask, and you know what? And, and nobody's seen it. But this war has already begun. Ukrainians are Scythians. Okay, so the war of Gog and Magog has already started. They just don't have all these allies yet and it hasn't gotten bigger. Well, they're seeing us as very weak too, the United States. Say what? Yeah. Well, they're seeing us as very weak, especially when uh, the mm -hmm. vice president takes over. I think that's probably, in my opinion, from what I'm so they're intentionally doing that. I mean, uh, the Blood Money book, Blood Money, what time is it, 8.30? I don't want to talk about the eclipse a bit, but the, the book Blood Money is, uh, was released this Monday and it has documents leaked from the Chinese government, from the Mexican government, from our government. And in it, China, like these are internal communications that were not intended to be seen by the public. And China's talking about how, what they're doing, their whole plan and everything they're doing they, the Chinese call it disintegration warfare against the United States. So they are, what you're seeing with these immigrants, what you're seeing with all the, like they're, they're using social media to make us hate one another. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're doing everything they can to cause us to hate each other and hurt each other and cause chaos, right? Anything they can think of to do that, they're doing because they want us to destroy ourselves from within, like you said first. And the drugs. Yeah. So then they're going to try to help, you know, make this civil, how, you know, think about it. If, if Trump does get put back in power, you know, uh, the way we, I believe is going to happen. Um, how would New England have the courage to fight? Okay. They don't have oil access. They wouldn't be in charge of the military necessarily. So how would they do that? Well, the only ex, ex, you know, possibility for me is uh, foreign powers encourage them to. They're gonna have to have some foreign power say, we'll back you. Mm -hmm. That guy shouldn't be in there, right? And that, I'm sure that'll be helpful Russia and China, mm -hmm. you know, and some global elites from the Western, from Europe saying, yeah, we don't like Trump. We'll help you, we'll fund you, we'll get it going, yes. Where does Alaska you know, stay in this? Like right next to Russia, right? Good question. I don't know anything about Alaska. Well, I do know in the invasion period. I don't know what happens to Alaska in between now and the invasion. I haven't seen anything about that. But I also don't have to know that. Um, so, but I do know that Russia comes down over Alaska when they do the invasion. They come in through the northwest. China comes in through the, uh, uh, you know, through the west, through the California area. Um, uh, Muslims and uh, Latin Americans come up through the, like Venezuelans come up through the southern border. And uh, then the Russian Navy comes in from the east. And I thought originally for a long time, I thought it was only Russians, but I, I now am, am, have more information. I suspect that it's the Russian Navy, but that the people on board are all Muslim. Like they're all from Muslim countries. But I'm not, I, I'm not sure about that yet. What about Canada? What is it? Canada's destroyed. Yeah. Canada, they, they treat Canada worse than they do us. Yeah. Trudeau is... Yeah, no, they... they if, you, if you're a Canadian, you need to get out. If you can go somewhere else. The things that have been seen about Canada, it's not good. It's not good up there. Australia and New Zealand are attacked the same day, and so is England. Like, it's a huge, huge attack. You said God is the leader. The leader. The way yeah. it yeah. God right. over the land. Right. Okay. All right, well, let's jump to the eclipse real quick. I, I, I alluded to it. Um, you know, you can't make up an eclipse. I can tell you about <laughs> dreams and visions, and you can decide if you want to or not, but you're going to be aware of this eclipse. And there are some very crazy things surrounding this eclipse. Um, I think I'll probably just have to barely touch on it because I did want to talk about these, how to help other people, get other people awake. Um, 
But basically, this you see this line right here, this first line up top, that was an eclipse that came through on 2017. Okay. The next one is from 2023, from last year, from October 14, 2023. This line going up that way, that one is still to come, is coming in a few months. Now, let me make sure I don't miss anything. Um, a few things, I'm going through it real fast. We can talk, maybe I'll be able to go over more of this in future weeks. I'm gonna do, there's so much prophetic encoded in this eclipse. I'm going to have to do, I think, at least seven different videos on my YouTube channel about it. Like, it's so much. Um, I know a lot of, quote-unquote, watchmen talking about it are, like, overwhelmed by the amount of data that God is just screaming at us with this. Um, but I'll tell you a few things. I'm just going to try to go through some things. So the first thing we're seeing is these three eclipses form one, two three X's, okay? So one way to think about it is three strikes and you're out, okay? And that's essentially what God is saying with this. He's, this is not a, a warning eclipse. Like it really, he's not saying, well, let me tell you what he's not saying. He's not saying, uh, please pay attention, please repent, you're going too far. This eclipse is saying, Judgment has been declared. Brace yourself. Okay, that's what he's saying. Get ready. So, this X here, this place where it crosses right here, this is like the main place, the main hub. That's like the main focus. There's so much going on right there that's important. But just we're going to touch on something right now. You, there's a there's a town there that's kind of at the center of it, um, named Carbondale, and most a lot of places talk about Carbondale. It's about this. It's in southern Illinois. It's about the size of, uh, um, you know, maybe Gainesville here in Georgia. You know, it's not a big town, but Carbondale, uh, while it was a small kind of more rural little city, has the has had the the amazing. Um, Amazing change over the past two years. They have become uh, the abortion capital of the middle of America, okay? Because all of these surrounding states have banned abortions, which is good. And now the unrepentant people living in those states are driving to Carbondale to get abortions. So they've opened multiple abortion clinics in this little town and right where that X is, okay? So that strike is about abortion. The second strike up there on the west is about the alphabet people, okay? So, if you know what that is, right? The, that eclipse enters into Salem, Oregon about 70 days before that eclipse began, the governor of Oregon signed into law the very first protection bill for TRANS people, okay? And uh, that was the first of its kind. And then the very next, 70 days later, on the 20th, so, and by the way, she signed that bill on Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is the day she signed the bill, okay? True Hebrew Pentecost, not Christian Pentecost. Um, let me explain. Hebrew calendar, Pentecost, the same one where the apostles got the fire, that Pentecost, not the Romanized calendar Pentecost that isn't the real date. That's what I mean, okay? Pentecost, if I remember right, is also the day that God gave the law to Moses. Mm -hmm. So the day God gave the law to Israel, she is signing into a law, a law against the law of Moses on the same day. Every single one of these eclipses occurs on the 29th. These are three eclipses. All three occur on the 29th of Av, which is the last day. I'm sorry, 29th of a Hebrew month. Not always on Av. 29th of a Hebrew month. The 29th of any Hebrew month is a special day of fasting and repentance called the Yom Kippur Katan, which means the little Yom Kippur, the little day of repentance. Okay. So, and this 
the 2017 one happened on the 29th of Av, which was basically the last official Yom Kippur Katan of that year in the Hebrew calendar. So basically what God is saying with that is, I saw what you did. You signed the law. I'm gonna, this is your last possible moment to repent. Are you going to repent? It's Yom Kippur Katan. Nope, they did not. Okay. The third X down here is on San Antonio. I am still researching. I've heard, I've seen some others talk about this, but I haven't seen the evidence for it. I have seen some evidence. There are some significant grants that have been given to um, San Antonio, the University of Texas in San Antonio, working on new biomedical technology involving nanoparticles and uh, certain curable, injectable cures and things like that. So, um, and the National Institutes of Health is run by Anthony F, right? Everybody knows who he is. I'm trying to avoid the censors. Um, yeah. So, Mr. Fauci, right? Um, and so, I, I think that that X is related to the injectable cures and the future mark, okay? That is being planned. I think that's what that is representing. I do know that Anthony in Spanish is Antonio and San Antonio is St. Anthony who is also associated with medical things, okay? It was a medical uh, uh, order in the Catholic Church. So that's what I think those are uh, about. We have some other things like um, on four days before this, you have four planets lining up in a very rare alignment between us them and the moon. That's six objects now in a line in front of the sun. Six is the number of man. man. What are the planets that are lined up? Well, um, Venus, Mars, Saturn, and Neptune. Curiously, Jupiter is not lined up in this combo, which um, I, I'm not gonna, I don't, I don't ha I actually haven't studied the planets enough to really do, you know, uh, dissect them symbolically in a really strong way, but I do have an understanding that Jupiter, um, while the sun is a symbol for the son of God and his divinity, sending truth and love into the world, Jupiter is the symbol for the son of man, for Jesus as the son of man, taking the wound in the side, and that's what the red spot is. Um, and when you uh, know anything about our solar system, you know that uh, Jupiter saves us from all kinds of meteor strikes. They take, Jupiter takes all our blows for us. Like there's all, a lot of symbolism there, but Jupiter's not lined up. Instead, you have Saturn, the god of hell, okay, lined up, and Mars, the god of war, and Venus, the whore of Babylon, lined up. Okay, and Neptune would be the god of the ocean, which is the world, okay? So the world, the devil, war, and the whore of Babylon are lined up. Then you have this pattern. This is a Hebrew letter. You may not recognize it. It's because the Hebrew letters you're used to uh, were developed after the exile from Babylon. Um, in the time of Solomon, David, Moses, etc. this was the Hebrew letter Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. This was how it was drawn. Okay, So this, these three eclipses have formed an Aleph, which in Greek would be Alpha, over the United States. When you look at just, and this one is, uh, now keep in mind, this one here is a little different from the other two. The two that make an X are total solar eclipses and those are very rare. Those have only happened uh, eight times in American history and they always happen at a time of war. Okay, the first two happened during the American Revolution. The next ones were at the Civil War and now, now, okay? Which, assuming they're predicting a war is what we're believing. But this other one was called an annual or solar eclipse is a little bit different, not quite as amazing as a total solar eclipse. So it's important to see the Aleph, but it's not the main one. The main one is here, just seeing these two. This forms a cross or a Tav. Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. 
It's a cross, but it's also X marks the spot, X marks the carcass, okay, in this case. And uh, Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, or Omega in Greek. So if Jesus is speaking, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, in, in Hebrew, he would have said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. And so these eclipses are Jesus' signature, that he is the author of these. And then we have on Passover, so this, this is happening not only on the 29th of uh, a Hebrew month, the April 8th eclipse is happening on the last day of the Hebrew religious year. The very next day is Nisan, the first day of the next year, okay? And um, a few weeks after that is Passover. And on Passover, we've got a comet coming by our planet named Devil's Comet. They renamed it Devil's Comet, okay? It's got a 70 year cycle. We discovered it in 1812, in July of 1812. Now, um, last year on July 20th, exactly uh, 200 years after it was discovered, it erupted a volcano on it erupted, an ice volcano erupted and started spewing gas and created one of its horns that we're calling it the devil horns now. That happened one week after, in 2023, after the new governor of Salem, Oregon, signed a second bill, created even more rights for TRANS and guaranteeing protections for abortion. One week after that, the volcano on this comet erupted on Halloween, a second one erupted and it turned into a devil. It is reaching the closest place to the sun on Passover. And then it is going to be closest to earth on June 2nd, exactly 40 days after Passover, which is the time of testing. Okay, 40 is the time of testing. And it's important to remember that number 40 for a reason because First, we're gonna talk about a couple of things. Like I said, there's a lot to understand, but the first comet in 2017 crossed seven Salem. Seven cities named Salem are in its path. And a lot of online people are talking about Jerusalem being connected to this, but Salem means peace. Salem means peace. It's related to Shalom. Salem means peace. Okay. So what is happening to these seven Salem's during this eclipse. They are being darkened, okay? So, peace is being darkened across the land, is the message. And how is peace being darkened? Well, how many are there? Seven. Seven is the number of? Completion. So peace is going to be darkened completely. Okay. Now, some critics have said, oh, that's, that's not a big deal. There's 36 Salem's in the United States. Okay, granted. So it's just a coincidence. Fine. But when you go back and you look at these three, these three lines darken 33 of the 36 Salem's in the United States. What do you think the probability of that is? Okay, that's 90% of the Salem's. So maybe 10% of us are gonna be just fine. I don't know. I'm hoping I'm among the 10%. <laughs> All right, so another thing, the last city, the last city on this line over here, the last city over here where it's exiting South Carolina the name of it is, the name of the town right down the coast where it exits is called Graves. So the eclipse begins by darkening peace and ends with graves. Self-explanatory. This line, now the other line here, going up here, another curious thing, and Stacy helped me see this, I, I kind of heard it, but you gave me the list. That one darkens seven cities named Nineveh, okay? Seven cities named Nineveh. 
Now here's the thing. Go back and look at this line. See how narrow that line is? It's a narrow line. There are only seven cities named Nineveh in the United States, and that line darkens every single one of them. There's one more Nineveh in Canada, and it darkens it too. <laughs> the only other Nineveh in the world is in England, and it darkens it too. <laughs> Not fully, because it's ending right as it gets there, but it's still touched by the eclipse. Yes? What does Nineveh mean? Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Okay, and where I'm calling this feature of it the sign of Jonah, okay, because Jonah was a prophet, from Israel, from the northern kingdom, that God said, Nineveh was the capital, it was up there in Turkey, you know, northern Iraq, right? But they created this big empire, and they're the ones who came down and eventually conquered the northern kingdom and took them away, right? But the Assyrians were known as being vicious people. The people of Nineveh were vicious people, very violent. They used to stick, when they capture uh, their enemies, they would bring them back and they would uh, set them on top of uh, really sp spiky Space. posts up their butts, and they would let them slide down slowly until it came out their head. Okay, that's the kind of things that they would do. So the northern kingdom hated them. The Israelites hated them, and they were feared them. You know, think of Islamic State. That's how they felt about them. Okay. So Jonah, in the middle of that, God told Jonah, go and preach to Nineveh and tell them to repent. And Jonah basically said, no, I'm not going to because I hate the Ninevites and I know if I go tell them to repent, they're probably going to repent and then you're going to spare them because you're so merciful, God. And I want you to destroy them, so I'm not going. And so he didn't. He got on a boat and he went the other way towards Spain. And so God sent a huge storm. The sailors started having to throw everything overboard and Jonah came and said, fine, it's me. Throw me overboard. So they did, and a, the great fish came up and swallowed Jonah. And he was dead inside the fish for three days. And then the fish spit him out, and God brought him back to life. Okay. And uh, then Jonah finally went to Nineveh, because that's what he told God. If you let me out, I'll go. So he went, and recently, I just saw this the other day, scholars have figured out that there was a total eclipse over Nineveh in that same year. So was it right at the time Jonah was preaching? I have to believe so. I mean, there was this guy that's been bleached white by the acid of the stomach of a fish telling him to repent. You got a total eclipse blocking the sun. I have to imagine that might be why they repented. Um, but they did repent. And Jonah went back out and he said, he watched because he wanted them to die. So he's, think, he's seeing if God's going to forgive him or not. And they repented. They really did. They, they put on sackcloth. They begged God for forgiveness. They repented before him and he spared the city. And God, the book of Jonah says, an interesting thing is that he grew up a plant while it was hot. And so to help Jonah in his anger and bitterness, he grew up a plant over Jonah to take care of him. He gave him shelter. And then he put a worm the next day and it killed the plant. Jonah got really mad. <laughs> and um, I'll read you what it says because this is really interesting. It shows you God's nature and how loving he is. And these, these signs, if he was not a loving God, would he give these signs? Mm -hmm. No. He just slam you, do whatever he wants, start over. Who cares? You know, he's a very loving and patient God. Okay. So anyways, uh, God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. I'm so mad about the plant. <laughs> but the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city? in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and the left and much livestock. That phrase to discern between your right hand and left, that means you're a child, okay? It means child. He's saying, 
Shouldn't I pity Nineveh? I know they've done horrible things, but they got 120,000 innocent kids and a lot of animals. If I destroy the city, those have to die too. Right? So God has a different perspective from us, and this is why he's being patient. So if he is executing judgment on the United States, it's not because he's mean. It's because he has decided that more children will be harmed by us being left to our own devices than there will be if he judges, right? Because he loves kids. And that's where we've screwed up. Um, anyways, so the science, so the, basically Nineveh is basically Jonah, what Jonah told Nineveh was, you have 40 days to repent. He said, repent or in 40 days your city will be destroyed. That was the message that Jonah gave. So when this eclipse is darkening seven cities named Nineveh, or eight cities named Nineveh, it catches our attention. Since back then it was an Israelite going to Nineveh, now it's darkening Nineveh in Israel, okay? And there's another city on this line. There's another city down there in Texas before the first Nineveh, the name of that city is Jonah, Texas. So it darkens Jonah first and then completely darkens Nineveh, seven minutes. And on and on. I mean, I could go on for There's so much more. Um, last, thing I'll, uh, last thing I'll focus on, then I'll take questions if we have it about this, um, is right here in this X, I talked about Carbondale. By the way, uh, so see this right here? Okay, see this? This is the amount of area that is being darkened by the two, both eclipses, okay? It's not a lot of the United States, right? It's a very small area on a map. Carbondale is right there. But look what, it, and by the way, look what uh, Carbondale is doing. They've created marketing around the eclipse. Mm -hmm. We're doing abortions over here. Let's celebrate the eclipse that's pretending our doom. Um, you know, it reminds me of, you guys seen the movie Independence Day? Mm -hmm. Remember the, the idiots on top of the skyscraper dancing and holding up signs welcoming the aliens until they get blasted? <laughs> that's kind of what that reminds me of. But anyways, this red line, so these blue lines out here, those are the whole path that will see the total eclipse. They'll be totally darkened, okay? The red line is exactly the middle between those. Like it is the exact center point. You follow me? So the exact precise center point of both these red lines is right there. And it's not on Carbondale. It's a little town called Makanda. M-A-K-A-N-D-A. Uh, no, don't have it pulled up. Anyways, Makanda is an Indian word. It means woman of power. Okay, and I don't know if that's just referring to the feminist spirit that is behind the abortion movement or if it's referring to Kamala Harris or what. Uh, probably both. But very interesting thing. Let's look up. I'm going to go over here. Let's just type in Google. Makanda Festival. They're known for one thing and one thing only. It's a tiny town. They only do one thing a year. It is Vulture Fest. Vulture Fest. Okay. Village of Makanda. Tourism and events. Where's the vulture? There it is. Vulture Fest 2024. It's the gathering of the vultures. What did Jesus say? He was telling the disciples about all these things that were going to happen. And they said, where, Lord? Not when, where? And he said, where the carcass is, there the vultures were gathered. Where the carcasses, there the vultures were gathered. So this X is marking, in my opinion, the carcass. Okay, and there's all kinds of other little things around there. Like there's a there's a monument called the Devil Stand Table. There's another park associated with the devil. There's another uh, park associated with the giants. You know, which are related to the Nephilim of Genesis. There's just so much. Like I could go on. Like every section of these eclipses has cities in them that spell things prophetically, like write sentences out. It's really incredible. But that's all we're going to go over tonight. Do we have any questions about this? 
I did want to say one thing about approaching others. Yes, Michael. I, I just wanted to mention uh, that one, um, it's a path for over Eagle Pass as well. Yes. So, yes, it, it enters the country through Eagle Pass where the Texas National Guard, um, the Texas National Guard took over from the federal government. This is where all the immigrants were coming through. And so this eclipse is basically resembling the path of the invading army, this fifth column we've been talking about. And curiously, the X is right over San Antonio. Well, the San Antonio police have been exposed as using their off-duty police officers to escort these people all over the country. So the San Antonio police off-duty cops are going down to the Eagle Pass area. The Red Cross and the nonprofits have these processing centers. The off-duty San Antonio police and probably other police forces, but San Antonio police have been singled out, have been taking them, putting them on airplanes, giving them debit cards, driving them places, um, really helping out. So, another curious thing that they're... So, Eagle Pass, Jonah, and then the Nineveh's. Yep. Any other questions? All right, well, we're going to break here, but let me just say this. Um, we'll talk... Man, we've got to make more time for this next week, but I want to read to you some of the things, and we'll, we'll wrap up, that sometimes people might say to you, you try to talk to them about these end times events, you try to warn them, has anybody had anybody respond to you with, oh, my God's got me. He's in control. I'm just going to, I don't have to worry about this. I'm just going to trust my God. Anybody say that to you? Yeah. Um, how about this? Oh, everybody's got their own interpretation of prophecy. Yeah. Okay. How about this one? People have been saying it's the end of time forever. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about this one? We're going to be raptured, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. How about this one? Well, God hasn't spoken personally to me about that. You haven't heard that one? I have. I'm not about putting fear in people. It's too scary to think about. It makes me scared. Okay. I'll know it when it happens. Yeah, you will. Okay. So let's just, I guess what I'd like to just highlight is Rather than take a, we don't have, I want to break because it is late. I've talked too much already. But don't let those arguments shut you down. Okay, because what they're doing with a lot of those is making you feel bad. Like somehow you're the bad Christian. Okay, for even approaching or broaching the subject. Okay. And in reality, the, the spiritual maturity that they're projecting is false. Okay. For example, if someone says, my God's got me, he's in control, they're projecting that they are just, they have so much faith and you are in fear and you should be like me and just trust. We don't have to worry about these things, right? That's what they're saying, implied. But you can, you know, resolve this within yourself. If someone says that to you, they have no faith. Okay, they have no faith. And you say, well, you can't know that. Yeah, I can. I can know it by what they said. Okay. Because what they have is wishful thinking. Wishful thinking says, my God's got me. He didn't promise that. He didn't promise that. Why, why do you think he's got, why do you think you're going to be okay? He didn't promise you'd be okay. You have something in the Bible that says, you, John Smith, are going to be okay. Where did, where's that? What do you mean? We're not appointed to wrath. Well, I don't know. You might be appointed to wrath the way you're talking. Okay? Because faith is, has an object. The object is what has God said. You trust what God has said, not what you want to be true. All right? So if Jesus says in Scripture, watch and pray, that you might escape, then that is what we're to do. Faith means I believe what Jesus said and I act in obedience to what he said. I watch and I pray that I might escape. It, so to say, my God's got me, I don't gotta worry about it, is a lie because he didn't say that, that you were allowed to have that attitude. He said you needed to watch and pray 
and pay attention. And he said that you need to study his word, which includes prophecy. And if he's speaking today, which I am, I am bearing witness that I believe Jesus is speaking today through prophetic words and dreams and visions, and I think he's saying very clear messages, and I think in those messages, he's saying the same thing to everybody. And he's telling them, get your house in order, meaning pray every day, be obedient, move into faith, Bible every day. And he's saying, store up food. And if he's telling that to people and you're not listening, then you're gonna starve, okay? If you don't act on it, right? So that's why I'm saying they don't actually have faith. These are the same ones that in the Old Testament said, Calamity is not going to overtake us, right? That's not, a, it just sounds like faith, but it's not. Anyone, everyone understand that, right? And just know, if somebody says, everybody's got their own interpretation of prophecy, or they say people have been saying uh, it's the end of uh, time forever. If they say that, it means they haven't ever read prophecy. It means they've, they've spent very little time in it. Okay, because if they'd spent any kind of time in it, they would know that it's not possible to interpret a million different ways. And it's very intriguing, and God obviously wants us to know things, right? So, anyways, I, maybe next time we could spend more time on it. Do we have any last questions? No? Nope. Talked out. All right. Stacy, would you close us in prayer? Yeah. Oh, heavenly and gracious Father, we just praise you and we just love you and we thank you that we have the freedom that we can come and actually learn about what your word says. Father, we're supposed to read it, we're supposed to study it, and we're supposed to take it into heart and understand it um, to the level that you've written it. And Father, don't let us get discouraged when we try to go out and take what you've taught us, what you've written in scripture, that's living word, when we try to take it out and share it with other people and they brush us off, Father, don't let that get us discouraged to where we won't continue talking. You've called us to do that. We can share the good news and we can share what you are showing people and speaking to people and visions and dreams and warning. You're giving us warning, Father. We've learned that. We've seen its evidence. And Father, we are just praying that when we do share this message with others, that you penetrate their heart with the words. Um, it's your words, and that you will move in their hearts for them to search even further, not to just brush it off or you know say they don't believe in it, but to search for themselves so you can have a chance to turn their hearts back to you. Father, those that are not with us today, we just ask that you be with them, meet them in their moment. Be with us as we leave tonight and, and carry out the rest of the week and weekend until we meet again. Father, give us courage, give us strength to go out there and speak to people. Um, you didn't put a, a, a spirit of fear in us, mm -hmm. but a spirit of courage and boldness. Mm -hmm. And if we proclaim the name of Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have that same power, that same Holy Spirit in us. And we shall walk in mm -hmm. boldness and know that your power resides in us and that we can't mess up your plan. And that if we give you our yes, you will give us everything that we need. Um, to spread the word and to warn people and to bring them closer in to you and into repentance. Mm -hmm. That's what you're calling us to do is repent and repent. And that's something we need to do every day, but it's not just an individual repentance. It's a nation mm -hmm. repentance. So, Father, we love you and um, we praise you and we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, one more thing. Uh, uh, you asked how, though, you could share it. I did create one specific compilation video on my channel that I designed it hoping that you could use it as a kind of kind of, kind of tool to help people open their eyes. And that's the one that's called God is Warning Us About Disease X. Oh, I saw that, that one is a bunch of clips of people talking about their own dreams and their own words. And it's not just me talking. So, um, you know, one thing you can do is say, hey, take a look at this video. Tell me, uh, do you... Do you also, I feel like there's a phenomena here. Do you also, do you feel like maybe God is talking? So many people seem to be hearing the same thing. Something along those lines. Ask them for their opinion after watching it. Do they think God is, is speaking to this? It's like a God phenomena. And, uh, and that can start a conversation because you're asking their opinion on, but they have to watch it to give their opinion. Make sense? All right, y'all have a great evening. Yeah.